The idea of stunning twins was actually Scott Kelly's idea. Uh, when he spoke to NASA, he said, you know, I have an identical twin brother. Might that be helpful in terms of biomedical research? It turns out he's got a really good point because Scott and Mark Kelly, they both have the same DNA sequence, in other words, the letters of the alphabet, but because they're two different people who have had two different life experiences, including these differences in flying in space, then there are other marks on the DNA called epigenetic information that could be different between the two twins. And uh, not just that, but the activity of genes could be different between the two. So it's, an, it's a, a very interesting way to approach differences that might occur to Scott uh, that um, aren't related directly to his DNA sequence. So it's really important for us to have a set of twins that were both experienced at, in space flight. So for us, you know, Mark had previously flown on short missions and he'd been retired for a while. And then we had Scott who was going to go on this really long mission. And what's great about having twins is that their, their DNA is identical. So any changes that we might see in Scott that weren't seen in Mark are not going to be due to differences in genetic sequence. And so since we know that genetic sequence and DNA can play such a huge role in distinguishing people from each other, it's nice to be able to have that control in Mark so that what we see is, is going to be independent of that uh, DNA sequence. Epigenetics is information in addition to your DNA sequence that tells genes not what they are, which is what the DNA sequence does, but what they should do. So where the DNA sequence are the, the, um, the letters and words of our genome, uh, epigenetics is kind of the grammar and it's related to which genes are working, which ones are silent, and that has to do with fundamentally why the different tissues of the body are different from each other. The eyeball, the heart, the spleen, they're all different tissues. They have the same genetic sequence, but they have different instructions that are telling them what to do. That sort of information, uh, telling genes what they should be doing and not, it's not just uh, related to the different parts of the body. It's also related to your exposure to the environment. So at some level, epigenetic information um, then includes the um, effects of environmental exposure. So that could be, for example, um, space travel could be obviously one of the things that would be considered here. The way that that information is stored in the DNA involves chemical changes in the DNA, such as a chemical change called DNA methylation, which is an extra carbon with three hydrogens, or CH3, that's stuck onto one of the four building blocks of DNA called cytosine, and that is a mark for genes generally that genes are turned off. So the focus of our study was to investigate how the epigenetics differed between Mark and Scott and also just within Scott from his time before he went on his mission, during his mission, and then how it looked after. And what epigenetics is, is um, a way that's kind of not changing the DNA sequence itself, but it's chemical modifications that occur to specific bases in the DNA sequence that can control or regulate how genes are turned off or on. So if you have a lot of what we measure, which is DNA methylation, which is um, a small chemical tag on cytosine residues, when you have a lot of methylation around a gene promoter, for instance, that gene is typically turned off. However, when there's no methylation present around that gene, it tends to be more highly expressed or turns on. And so what we're really looking for are these chemical modifications all along the DNA throughout the entire genome and how they differ both within Scott during his mission over time as well as between Scott and Mark so that we can distinguish you know, what changes uh, may be associated with his time in space. So one of the main challenges of this study was actually getting the samples from the space station back to the lab. So for epigenetic studies, for what we needed, it's very important for us to, to get uh, freshly isolated cell types out of the blood because we know that uh, DNA methylation epigenetics in particular can vary wildly uh, amongst tissues and amongst cell types in the body. It's just like how your heart cells have very different epigenetic profiles than your brain cells. They have very different functions and epigenetics is involved in controlling that. And so when we needed our samples, we needed to get specific cell types out of the blood. Well, to do that, we have to have freshly isolated blood. So what Scott actually had to do on the space station was when they were getting a delivery of supplies um, from Earth, 
he had to draw blood that day and put it on the spaceship that was going to return that blood home. And so we actually had um, samples within 38 hours of their being blood being drawn on the space station to back in the lab here on Earth, within 38 hours, which is quite a feat in and of itself. So they would go from the space station onto a rocket that landed in Russia, on a plane to Houston, on a truck to the lab, and then someone would be waiting at the lab at whatever time of the day that might be to isolate those cell types, at which point they could then be frozen and distributed to the labs that were going to analyze the data. So over the course of the year, we found that there were changes. If you look at all the genes across the genome, uh, overall there was a change in Scott's level of DNA methylation and Mark's, both of them. Scott's overall level of DNA methylation went down a little bit, Mark's went up a little bit. The variability in DNA methylation in Scott uh, went, became greater over the course of the year uh, and, then, and then went down after he returned to space. The overall, these levels converged to the same levels that that they had before the year and uh, also very similar to each other uh, during, that, um, during that time. Uh, the, you can't say that this is related to spaceflight, however, because uh, both Scott and Mark were in you know, their own environments. With an N of one is what we call it, um, you can't say that the differences that we see are related to spaceflight itself. It could just be the, the, the just differences in general between the environments or it could be um, uh, related to just random chance over that amount of time. So our main finding in the epigenetic study was that we saw variation in, in DNA methylation and epigenetics in both Mark and Scott. And what was perhaps surprising to us is that we saw just as much variability in Mark, if not more, in fact more, than we saw in Scott. And while we only have two subjects in this particular case, and so we can't say that the changes we saw in Scott were directly attributable to spaceflight, what we can say is that we didn't see levels of variation that were way off the charts or out of normal for what we would expect for someone just living their life, such as Mark. Um, what was also really interesting is that that variation in Mark was actually more, um, I'm not going to say extreme, but it was, it was a greater amount of variation than we saw in Scott. And that could be attributable to many different things, including the environment on the space station. You're in an isolated space for an entire year, whereas Mark could travel the world if he wanted. Also, the diets are going to be very different. Mark can eat whatever he wants, whereas whatever gets delivered to the space station, that's what Scott has to eat. And so, you know, there are many different things that could contribute to the differences that we did see. So another finding that we had was the changes that we saw in, in Scott over his time in space um, at specific regions of the genome were different than those that we saw in Mark. So while they both changed, at many different places, the specific locations and the genes where those changes occurred were different between the twins in, in many cases. And while alone, our data having only two subjects isn't enough to say that these particular genes were significantly differently methylated or there's big changes in epigenetics here, what it points to is, is genes that we could look at in future studies that may, when we have more data, reach that level of statistical significance. And what was encouraging was that it was consistent with data collected by other twins investigators suggesting that these genes and pathways may be impacted by the space environment that Scott experienced. In general, in science, you can't draw a conclusion from a single observation. And actually, I use the term N of 1. That is the very words that Scott Kelly used when he himself was uh, talking on a uh, NASA podcast about this study. Uh, in order to draw meaningful uh, relationships between a particular exposure like space flight and, um, and a change that you might see, you have to have multiple individuals and then show that there's statistical significance. In other words, that you see changes in the space travelers compared to non-space travelers that are greater than the variation that you see within the group of space travelers itself. You can't do any of those statistical tests in a study like that. So the, the main, actually the main importance I think of the study is it shows how you can do such work. And that is not trivial. So understanding how to do genomics in space is not an easy thing to do. So one of the limitations of our study is that we only have two individuals. 
And so with that, we really can't attribute the changes that we see, we can't ascribe them to a level of significance where we would expect to see them every time an astronaut goes to space. What we have instead is we have observations that say, hey, maybe there's a perturbation in this pathway or these genes that would be interesting to follow up on in future studies. What we have in Scott could just be an outlier, and when we would never see that change again if we looked at 50 astronauts. And because we don't have other data, we can't distinguish an outlier from a true signal that's going to change no matter who goes into space for that length of time. Now that we know that you can see changes and measure them in astronauts. We did not know that that would be the case. We don't know the significance of that because we haven't studied enough. The real question is, can we use this kind of information to predict what's going to happen to people when they go on long distance missions to Mars? So I think the right kind of study would be to look at um, many astronauts, maybe all of them really, if, if we could get them to agree, if we could work that out, uh, who are going on short missions of three months, longer missions of six months, missions of a year, and use some of the same methods we developed in our study. To, we could apply them in order to project what are the changes that you're going to see over that sort of time that are likely then to continue to progress as you go out to a multi-year mission. If we could do that, we might be able to anticipate in astronauts individually or as a group what sort of health problems they might run into. We won't have the problem of a single set of observations then. We'd have a much larger number. We might be able to make statistically meaningful conclusions about what changes we see during spaceflight that are related to spaceflight if we did such a study. But we also might be able to make predictions about what's going to happen to individual astronauts and then prepare for that, not necessarily exclude or select astronauts based on this analysis, but have the right kind of either medicines or anticipate the kind of problems they might have so that they're able to remediate those problems when they're on Mars for a longer period of time. I think that might actually be possible. And in fact, I think the most important part of our study was that it inaugurated really the genomic era of space travel. Although we can't draw statistically meaningful conclusions about space travel from them, we showed it can be done and how to do it. And and now I think that that sort of study, that sort of analysis can be included within the armamentarium of biological and medical data that are collected on astronauts so that we can mitigate the health problems that they have on long-term space flight. So the next directions are clearly to include more astronauts in these types of studies. I think one of the great um, strides that our study takes is showing that we can do the, this kind of genomic uh, work on the space station and with this population, these astronauts. And Given that we've already kind of laid out the roadmap of how the logistics of this could work and the kind of data that we can generate, we can now do this across every astronaut that, that flies to the space station for any length of time. And by generating all of this data together, we can then start to build a picture of what happens to the human body over any duration space flight. And so, Again, just more data needs to be done, uh, generated on more astronauts so that we can start to reach that level of significance where we can really point to the things that we should be on the lookout for and have astronauts and, and the space station be, be prepared for any um, medical issues that may arise and we can maybe even predict what medical issues may arise during longer duration space missions.